Hello, my name is Mao Zashkar, and I'm a third-year medical student at the University of Saskatchewan. Today, I'm going to talk about an approach to cleft lip, cleft palate, and cleft lip and palate. This video is in conjunction with Dr. Janine Roller, a plastic surgeon in Vancouver. Today, we will go over the following topics regarding cleft lip and cleft palate. A cleft is defined as a slip or gap in something. A cleft lip is a separation in the upper lip, which can vary in size. It can range from a small notch to a large gap that extends up to the nose. A cleft palate is a failure in the formation of the palate during embryonic development. This results in a split in the roof of the mouth. Cleft palates can occur in isolation or can manifest with cleft lips. Let's explore the demographic patterns associated with these conditions. First, it is very important to understand that cleft lip with or without cleft palate and isolated cleft palate are genetically and epidemiologically very distinct. Oral clefts in general, including isolated cleft palate, cleft lip, and cleft lip and palate, occur in roughly 1 to 690 live births, and the majority of these are cleft lip and palate. For specifically cleft lip and palate, most occur on the left side of the face and are the highest in Asians and in males. In isolated cleft palate, there is no difference in racial distribution and is more frequent in females. Oral clefts are of embryonic nature. Thus, having a strong understanding of embryology is essential. To understand the embryological origin of cleft lip, we must first understand that the face forms from five facial primordia as circled in red. The lip forms during weeks four to seven when the medial nasal prominence, which is in green, contacts the maxillary prominence, which is in yellow, in the tenth week as circled in blue. The failure of this process results in cleft lip. Now let's go over the upper lip anatomy and its important surface landmarks. The philtrum is the vertical indentation in the middle of the upper lip. It is highlighted in yellow. The philtrum columns are the ridges on either side of the philtrum. It is highlighted in green. The vermilion is the red or pink part of the lip that is visible. It is highlighted in light blue. The white roll is a line of slightly lighter colored skin that outlines the vermilion border. It is highlighted in pink. The red line, also known as the wet dry border, is the line where the lip mucosa, the wet inner part of the lip, transitions to the vermilion, the drier outer part. It is highlighted in dark blue. The cupid's bow is the double curve of the upper lip. It is highlighted in black. The tubercles is the vermilion fullness right below the cupid's bow. It is highlighted in gray. In the anatomy of a cleft lip, notable changes include a shorter philtrum, and the vermilion width is reduced on the medial side of the cleft. It is also crucial to acknowledge the presence of associated cleft nasal deformity although this aspect will not be covered in this particular discussion. The palate can be divided into two main portions, the primary and secondary palate. The primary palate is anterior to the incisive foramen and contains only hard palate. The hard palate provides a firm surface against which the tongue can press food during chewing. Additionally, it separates the oral cavity from the nasal passages above playing a crucial role in speech and swallowing. The secondary palate is behind the incisive foramen. It contains both the hard palate and soft palate. The soft palate is a flexible region that consists of muscle fibers and connective tissues and is responsible for closing off the nasal passages during swallowing, thus preventing food from entering the nasal cavity. The soft palate ends at the uvula. Now let's go over palate embryology. It is important to note that primary and secondary palates have two different embryonic development processes. 
The primary palate is formed by the migration of the medial and lateral nasal prominences of the frontal nasal prominence fusing with the maxillary prominence at four to seven weeks of gestation. The secondary palate is formed through fusion and migration of the lateral palatal process of the maxillary prominence from the secondary palate at weeks 5 to 12. Interruption of the migration and fusion of these processes may result in the cleft of the palate. As stated before, cleft lip and palate and cleft palate alone are pathogenetically distinct. Cleft lip and palate is generally believed to result from a failure in the mesodermal tissue penetration. On the other hand, isolated cleft palate is thought to arise from an issue with the fusion of epithelial tissue. Now let's go over the etiologic factors for cleft lip and palate. Genetics contribute to 20 to 25% of non-syndromic oral clefts, where the remainder are associated with environmental factors. Environmental factors that increase the likelihood of cleft lip and palate include teratogen exposure such as smoking, alcohol, anticonvulsants, and retinoids. Malnutrition such as low folic acid intake, living at high altitudes, older parental age with paternal age being a more significant risk factor, the table to the right details the familial distribution for cleft lip and palate. This table serves as a valuable resource for those interested in understanding the familial patterns of this condition. Cleft lip and cleft palates can be divided into non-syndromic and syndromic clefts. Non-syndromic clefts are one or multiple anomalies that are due to a single event or primary malformation whereas syndromic clefts are more than one malformation involving more than one developmental field that occur together at least 15 to 20% of the time. An example of a non-syndromic cleft is pierre robin sequence, which includes retrogonathia, glossostosis, airway obstruction, and sometimes a U-shaped cleft palate. The primary malformation is mandibular hypoplasia, which displaces the tongue posteriorly leading to glossostosis. The tongue's abnormal position interferes with the closure of the palatal shelves during development, resulting in cleft palate. It is quite obvious how a single event, mandibular hypoplasia in this case, can cause multiple anomalies in Pierre Robin sequence. There are more than 300 syndromes that involve a palatal cleft. It is important to note that isolated cleft palate is more likely associated with syndromic conditions. The three most common syndromes are Stickler syndrome, which accounts for 25% of syndromic clefts. This condition arises from a mutation in the gene responsible for type 2 collagen, typically associated with Robin sequence, ocular malformation, hearing loss, and joint disorder. Velocardiofacial syndrome represents 15% of the syndromic cleft palates and is characterized by cardiovascular abnormalities, distinctive facial features, and developmental delay. Van der Woods syndrome accounts for 19% of syndromic cases and is notably associated with distinctive lower lip pits. Cleft lip are classified based on whether it is unilateral or bilateral and further subdivided into complete or incomplete. Incomplete clefts have an intact nostril as seen on the image on the far left. Complete clefts extend through the lip into the nasal floor as seen in the middle image. Microform clefts are often defined by a small vermilion notch at the vermilion border, white roll being imperfect and vertical lip shortness. There are several classification systems for cleft palate. Most are based on the affected area. The primary or secondary palate are both, whether they are right or left sided, and if they are subtotal or total. A cleft patient requires a comprehensive cleft team that typically includes a diverse group of specialists to ensure that all aspects of the patient's health and development are addressed. Now let's discuss pre-surgical management of cleft lip. Nasal alveolar molding 
and lip adhesions can be beneficial. The main goal of nasoalveolar molding is to reduce the size and severity of the cleft. It involves a molding plate similar to a dental retainer, which is fitted into the child's mouth. This plate helps in guiding the growth of the baby's gums and shaping the nose. The treatment usually begins within the first few weeks of life and continues until the child is ready for a cleft lip repair, typically around three to six months of age. The main objectives of lip adhesion is to convert a complete cleft lip into an incomplete one by helping straightening the gum line and repositioning the nose. During the procedure, the edges of the skin on both sides of the cleft lip are sewn together. The procedure is performed at one to two months of age and is indicated in patients with wide unilateral complete cleft lips. The pre-surgical management of cleft palate patients will focus on airway management, feeding, and hearing loss. Airway compromise is rare but commonly seen in Pierre Robin sequence. The degree or severity of airway compromise will dictate the intervention, which can include lateral or prone positioning, a nasopharyngeal airway, or endotracheal intubation. When feeding, a cleft palate hinders the creation of negative pressure, essential for effective suction, thereby causing feeding difficulties in infants. Treatment strategies include the use of nipples with large crosscut fissures, squeezable bottles, or palatal obturators to facilitate easier feeding. The incidence of otitis media in patients with cleft palate is 97%, and the incidence of hearing loss is nearly 50%. Early meringotomy tube placement is highly recommended as it may be associated with improved hearing and speech outcomes. The surgery for the cleft lip is done around three months. The two most common surgical techniques are the Fisher and Milliard. The goals are to create a symmetrical upper lip, restore the lip's functions, and minimize scarring. Now let's move on to the surgical management of the cleft palate patient. Now, if the patient has severe airway compromise, that must be firstly addressed. And there are several options. Firstly, tongue lip adhesion, where the tongue is advanced forward and sutured to the lower lip to prevent the tongue from falling back, causing airway obstruction. There is also mandibular distraction, osteogenesis, which involves cutting the mandible and attaching distraction devices that gradually pull the jaw forward over time. Finally, a tracheostomy is an option. To actually treat the cleft palate, a palatoplasty is used. It establishes normal palatal anatomy, separating the oral and nasal cavities. Surgery is usually performed between 9 to 18 months. The procedure helps with speech development, minimizes ear infection, and allows for facial growth. After cleft lip surgery, the wound care is followed by scar management with massage and silicone sheeting, and immediately after surgery, feeding can happen. The most common complications of correcting a cleft lip include whistling deformity, short lip, long lip, a widened lip scar, or lip landmark abnormalities. It is very important postoperatively for a cleft palate patient to monitor their airway and avoid over sedation to prevent respiratory compromise. Pain is managed and nausea is avoided as much as possible. The child is started on IV fluids and transitioned to a soft diet when possible. Long term cleft evaluations are done on an annual or biannual basis. Wound healing is assessed for dehiscence and fistulas between the oral and nasal cavities. Speech and velopharyngeal closure is reviewed for speech development. Facial growth is monitored and hearing is also assessed. In palatal surgery, patients may experience both acute and chronic complications. Acute complications include airway compromise, bleeding, prolonged hospitalization, dehydration, and death, which only occurs at a very low rate of 0.5%. Chronic complications include palatal fistulas, velopharyngeal dysfunction, malocclusion, and mid-face hypoplasia. Further surgical interventions may be necessary following the initial lip and palate repair. 
For instance, surgeries addressing speech issues stemming from velopharyngeal insufficiency are typically performed when the child is between 4 and 6 years old. Alveolar bone grafting is scheduled for ages 9 to 11. Nasal reconstruction can be optimally carried out between the ages of 12 and 18. And lastly, orthognatic surgery, which is contingent on the completion of mandibular growth, is generally considered appropriate for individuals over the ages of 16. Here are the key takeaways from my presentation. Cleft lip with or without cleft palate and isolated cleft palate are genetically and epidemiologically distinct. Etiological factors for oral clefts involve an interplay between genetic and environmental factors. Management of a cleft palate involves a diverse group of specialists. There are many pre-surgical and surgical options for oral clefts. Careful post-operative care is required to adequately manage oral clefts and minimize complications. Thank you for listening.